I'm just waiting to connect up here. Oh, there's the fucking guy, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, the incomparable Joseph Roland from Paul Bear. How you doing, man? I'm all right. Just, uh, yeah. Just trying to take it by, day by day. Day by day. A man, a man surrounded by synthesizers. <laughs> He's totally fine. I'm in like the most un- nondescript place on earth. I could be anywhere. I could be anywhere. <laughs> Uh, definitely not say Vitus, but I could be anywhere. <laughs> I was trying to figure out the best way to set this up, and then I like I spent a bunch of time doing it, and I was like, it just kind of looks like I'm in front of a green screen now. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So um, I've been uh, I've been you know starting off this series with like my first question for every guest so far has been, do you know? First of all is uh, where are you and where would have you have been if you weren't in quarantine at the moment? Well, I'm in, a, I'm in Green, uh, Greenpoint, Brooklyn. Yeah. Uh, I was actually supposed to be going down to Little Rock, uh, I guess, last week. Now I've kind of lost track of time. But I was going down to, to rehearse some stuff and do some uh, do some promo uh, for something. <laughs> for something. Don't know what. I mean, don't know what a guy from Paul Bearer would be doing promotion for. But yeah, all that got uh, got taken off the table really quickly. So yeah, that's to, to do a little bit of uh, try to be like quick on our feet and figure out ways that we can do some of the promotional stuff that we were supposed to be doing remotely. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, obviously, everything, the whole world has had to yeah. make this pivot in this, like, really kind of crazy way um, over the past, like, week. And, uh, yeah, it's it's a pretty it, it's a, a pretty wild thing to kind of just all of a sudden, you know, have everything shift like that. Is the entire rest of the band out in uh, Little Rock or in Arkansas right now? Yeah, yeah, everybody's in Little Rock. Uh, as far as I know, everybody is just kind of doing the same thing, you know, like, they're hunkered down. Everybody has their own house there, so I think they're just kind of, kind of laying low. I don't really know for sure, like what the what the scene is like in Little Rock right now, but I do know they have a curfew. Mm. Um, so like hardcore. I was I was surprised that they were that they had implemented that so quickly, but I think that so far the cases in Arkansas have been like relatively low too. So everything's like really spread out there. So everybody. <laughs> A little bit easier to social distance in the country, yeah, huh? I think in in my experience, it should be pretty easy to social distance in Little Rock. So. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as part of this series, you're going to kind of just take it from, from square one, you know? So I guess the first thing is just, did you grow up in Arkansas? I know I met you as a dude from Arkansas, but is that totally the case? I moved to Arkansas when I went to college. Oh, uh, shit. I didn't know that. I didn't grow up there. I actually, uh, I grew up, I was born in Bloomington, Indiana. In lived, Bloomington? Yeah. Lived wow. Lived there 10 years. Um, then I moved, basically, I, I, my parents moved with me down to north Louisiana, but like just across the border. It was like almost in Arkansas. Uh, uh-huh. There until I went to college. And then I moved to the Little Rock area to go to college. And then I was there for a long time before I moved to New York. I, I got it. New York five years ago. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, so when you first kind of, so your formative years are really like in Bloomington up through high school. High school was Bloomington no, as well. I, I was ten when I when I moved. You ten when you left. So like when I was a kid, when I was a young kid, I was in. Oh, we can got it. Yeah, and then so like high school, like middle school and high school was like yeah in the. South Arkansas, North Louisiana area. That's dope. That's dope. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. You're like, no. You're like, it was far away from everything, and just yeah, it was, you know, it was very, uh, very isolated. Very isolated. So, <laughs> being as isolated as you were, you know, when I was talking to Brian Cook a little while ago, you know, I, I never knew he grew up in Hawaii. Really? You know, and that, that, yeah, I was like, whoa, yeah, sure. you know, because I feel like when you meet people from bands or different people, you, you kind of identify where them from where the band's from in a lot of ways. But obviously the story 
uh, never really starts there, you know? And so I've been doing all of these kind of like talks and I'm like, holy shit, I've known Brian for many years and I never knew he grew up in Hawaii and I never knew you most of, you know, a good part of your early life was in, in Indiana. Mm-hmm. So when you started playing music, how how young were you? Like, what kind of started drawing you in? Well, my parents enrolled me in piano lessons when I was like six or seven. Wow. And okay. So it was like you're getting at a formal years. education in this. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I started in the classical realm, and at one point in time, was actually like pretty good at that. But I got, you know, I was like typical teenager by the time I was like. 16 or something i was like fuck this i don't really want to like spend all of this time practicing like all my free time is just being spent like learning all these pieces and like i just didn't really have any i just started to like drop off and was like uh eh, I, I don't really like want to do this that much anymore and then sure i i think i had aspirations of like doing something other than playing piano so like i at some point in time and in high school, like, my parents got me a bass. I started, like, messing around, like, playing, like, Blink-182 and shit like that. So, <laughs> was the, what, so the bass is that another thing that was kind of put, given to you. It wasn't, like, your choice. Like, oh, I'm, 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 like, picking one of these things. It's like, oh, I got this bass. Or is it like, <laughs> hey, I want to play bass and rock? I wanted to do it because my dad played bass when he was younger. And so, for whatever reason, hey. I had in my head that that was, like, I was like, I should try that too. I don't, I don't really remember like what about it drew me in. Yeah. Typically, but I, I don't know. I guess just that like one association with it. I was like, all right. Well, my dad used to do this when he was when he was a kid, so I'm gonna try it. Just following the lineage. Yeah. Just following the lineage. That's yeah. I always just think that it's always interesting going back to these like early life experiences, and and just kind of you know how much they've really influenced you and you kind of don't even know when you look back, do you look back at some of that early training and you're like, Holy crap, I'm so happy. My parents just kind of thrust me into it, even to just to have like yeah. a, a beginning or these foundations, you know? Totally. I mean, that was, that was definitely, even though I like at one point in time, I was like, I'm so sick of this. I wouldn't want to practice. <laughs> I was just, like, obviously like really, really crucial to my, knowledge as a musician like way later so yeah i mean i hear some of these you know harmonies that you guys are doing and some of the string arrangements on certain things i mean that you guys are pulling off and 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 now i think we we might see the uh the early germination of that many years ago and in your your earlier life which is like to me i find that always to be so interesting and also really like pure you know what i mean you're just there you're exploring things there's no, you know, you haven't really hit that phase yet where you're, you're just blank, you're tabula rasa, you know, you're, you're just hearing so much for the first time. And I feel like all of that really, um, those formative experiences, they really just, they stick with you for, for so long. And even even in the most subtle of ways, in, you know, like, oh, my, my piano teacher, this and that. And all of a sudden, years later, you're like, let me pick up the piano again. <laughs> and look at what you have behind you. <laughs> like, uh, yeah. If only I could play as well now as I did then. Now I just like yeah. On a, it's like mostly just like sequencing. <laughs> yeah. I just like like turn hit the button and let it play. Like I'll play it through like once and then I'll like like we'll let everything else like correct for me. So. Yeah. No. For sure. I mean, it, it's kind of amazing too that when you're a kid, it's it sometimes it's just so easy to like learn things too. You know. Um, and, and then sometimes when you get, you're an adult, you're like, oh my God, like I used to, I was like seven and I was like way better at this. Oh my I God. am now. <laughs> I feel that way actually with Spanish, uh, sometimes cause, uh, I speak Spanish and my, my family's from, from Bogota originally. And then, you know, uh, I mean, I grew up in my household where I'd speak Spanish often to my mom and my dad. And now I'm like, yo, my Spanish was dope when I was six. <laughs> like it's it's not really where it, it needs to be i think too sometimes you look back you're like wow um so for you once you started kind of like you know you're like okay cool i got my bass now i'm starting to listen to rock music or alternative music what were the things that were starting to really like grab you that were like oh i'm, I'm like this is this is like i'm i'm, I'm with this this is, these are my like cultures 
That, dude, it was really interesting because I like I grew up. I mean, like when I was after I had moved, when I moved from Indiana down to Louisiana, like I was I was in a really isolated area, and there wasn't anybody there that was like I would consider at all to be even into like punk or like metal or anything like that. So my my like main method of like kind of informing myself on that stuff originally was there was a, a college station that on like a really good night I could get <laughs> I get like two we're nights. just hanging out Joe we're just uh, hanging uh, on like a really good night I could like tune in and I would like sit in my room after I was supposed to have gone to bed mm. with like headphones on and listen to this college station they'd play like Smashing Pumpkins and that was the one for you yeah. Did they, were they playing like uh to, I've, I've been trying to like remember some of the other things that I remember them playing like really consistently then and I I remember that they played Veruca Salt, which is kind of Yo, like I love Veruca Salt. Yeah. I Such a good that. band. Yeah, man, they were great. They were really good and pretty like bad stuff too that at the time I had no like measure of like what was like good or bad. So there was like shit like all these like really like C or D grade like new metal bands like Taproot. <laughs> Do you remember, Do you <laughs> yeah, that? I remember that being. On <laughs> that was the pretty tap out band. It was Taproot. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I feel like all of these uh, formative kind of moments of like radio too are such a different thing too. Where you were like, like for me, we had this radio station. It's still around. It's called Q one hundred four point three. But Q104.3 used to have, um, it would, you know, in the 90s, it was so wild, you know, new bands getting signed all the time to major labels, different things, like really crazy stuff. Like the Jesus Lizard had a fucking, you know, major deal, like people like that, you know. And then you hear stuff like, you know, a quicksand or a VOD, like, you know, from my area, you know, I grew up on Long Island where I'm from. The, you know, the New York kind of area, and you're like, yo, this band is blowing up, that thing is happening, but Q104.3 used to have a show called Q It or Screw It, and, like, you know, like, they'd play, like, you know, some quicksand song or whatever, and then someone, oh, Bobby from America's on the phone, what do you think? And people would be like, Q It, that thing was fucking sick, and then they would put it on rotation. That's awesome. And like, on, like, like, a real big-ass station. That was, like, a com more commercial radio station, but, like, you don't have that level of access anymore or, or everything's coming to you. You get to pick. So yeah, I, I thought about that some and like recently that it's, it kind of sucks that there's not as much of a way to have that sort of like grassroots, like clandestine way of bands, you know, just like really grinding it out and getting fans like that. Like, yeah, I, I also think everything's so heavily curated that you kind of don't stumble on stuff as much anymore. I know that you, there's still other ways of doing it. That like, I, it's a bummer that like every radio station they just follow like other than like the really underground stuff. And I guess there's internet radio, but yeah, you know, unless it's somebody's like hour that they have on like a college radio station or something like that, everything is just like the same playlist on like every. Yeah, I think that that's why sometimes it's cool when, um, like, shout out to, actually, I think Gimme Radio does a good job with that. Actually, I saw Nate from Spirit of Drift, what's up? He's got a show up on there, and uh, Artie does too, for all you guys who want to check something out. But, um, you know, that's basically where musicians mostly, like, run the show. So you have, like, a DJ with, like, deep knowledge, Dean Rispler from fucking, you know, like, the Dictators and, like, a million other bands. Like, some a lot of people kind of around, and uh, I feel like a lot of people... Um, they discover this stuff, like, with my friends telling me, like, yo, this is fucking sick. I'm like, I am, it immediately goes to the top of the queue. I'm like, okay, why are my friends telling me that this is fucking awesome? Like, if you told me, like, you got to listen to this fucking band, then I'd be like, yeah. oh, okay, cool. Like, that's what's up. So I feel like um, some of those things are good, but when it becomes too algorithmy, then people start getting locked into sounds and that... I think is uh, like, it's a disservice, especially to really like younger people who are like really forming their palates, you know? Dude, kind of going back to what I was saying a few minutes ago about the radio station, like the next step from that for me when I was a kid was I started getting 
uh, some like punk zines. Like I would mm. order there. There's uh, you probably remember this like No Idea Records. I'm sure there's. Oh yeah, there. man, No Idea down in uh down in uh Florida, Gainesville, I believe. Yeah. there's No I Idea, right? I used to like order stuff from their mail order. Yeah, and, and had, like, they were in like all kinds of zines. Like they had uh, Maximum Rock and Roll, and there were a bunch of ones. I wish I could remember all of them. There was one in one zine in particular that I loved, and I ended up like figuring out how to subscribe to it, like outside of the. Just, oh wow! Like a mail-in kind of odd. It, it folded after only like seven or eight issues i think but it just had the best what was it called do you remember it was all like most of the magazine was just reviews of albums and so that's i would just read every single one and then i would just order any that sounded cool like i was just like I, yeah it it's crazy how like that now now you don't want to hear any asshole's opinion on like anything use my, uh, Good. Use my money for my job as a lifeguard <laughs> to, to, like, <laughs> just buy uh buy like shitloads of like cds and records and stuff and just like i was so hungry for new stuff because this was like a whole new like I didn't, there was nobody else to like tell me like at all like like this is cool or like whatever so i was just having to like find it all myself and so which, which like, is kind of like, great because you're yeah. coming at it with like you're such a like your own kind of like isolated perspective it must have been like when did you start finding other people who maybe had like you know those like interests or like going to a show or doing doing yeah, stuff like that it wasn't until i moved uh for college like i was just there wasn't anybody wow. that nobody that i went to school with or anything like was into anything cool like that is <laughs> crazy to me that but 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 incredible so you you were like this pent up ready to go Oh yeah, thing, right? I started like showing out as soon as I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I, got, yeah. I went and got my lip pierced like the week that I got there. I like went and got Yeah. It. You're like I'm in the big <laughs> I'm in the big city of uh Little Rock. Is that where college was? Uh, it's been Conway. It's like a suburb of Little Rock. Okay, cool. So in the in the big suburb of Conway and like we're going to start going to shows. What were some of the shows that you started to see when that were coming around? Dude, the first week that I I got there, I went and saw Minus the Bear. Oh shit! Yeah, um, okay, that's from the uh, the Brian Cook diaspora yeah. there. Um, tap 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 tap. Yeah, tap, dude, tap. that was fucking amazing. I still remember that show really well. It's like one of I still think like one of my favorite shows that I've ever been to. At wow. least I think it's like really like lodged itself in my memory. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had a wonderful show with them at St. Vitus, and it was just so cool to kind of see them, you know, kind of plan after all those years, and just, it, it was just, I think they they, they called it a day, um, maybe like a year or two afterwards. I was just so happy to kind of get them in, because Botch and everything around that kind of like scene and that diaspora of people, I think have just produced such great music, so yeah. I feel like I was... I was like, collect the whole set. You know, I, I would have loved that to happen, and so it did. And that was a great night at uh, a great night at Vitus. You know, it reminded me of some of the first times I saw the one. They weren't playing in front of fifteen hundred people, but like one hundred and fifty or two hundred, and you could see Dave just like yeah, Dude, this going one, uh, nuts. I was like, what is this? It was when they were still like a pretty new band. I think they, uh, I think they had only just put out their EP. They hadn't even put out a full length yet. It was like wow, like. like very shortly after botch had broken up wow wow so just totally right there that's crazy yeah it, well, yeah i totally when what a, what a band to to first see you know what i mean like out of like all of all of the ones it could have been like you know yeah the arkansas yeah. slashers or whatever and it could have been i remember there, also like minus the there is a within, good one <laughs> within a like Probably like two or three weeks of coming up there, I saw Wake for the first time from Little Rock, mm, uh, and that yeah. and that was a yeah. that was a turning point. Dude, at the time, I was kind of like, "What the fuck is going on?" Like, I it was like so primal that I like I couldn't even like really understand what was happening. And then I like, yeah, I, just I, like I, I, I got to go back and kind of. I wasn't even sure that I really liked it at first. It was like so insane, and then like. 
I saw them like again and I was like, okay, now I, now I get this. And mm. that was like the start of them having like a very profound effect on, on my life after that. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. It's interesting at like what moment, you know, you encounter heavy music and it just moves you in this different way. And and sometimes, yeah, at first you kind of like, oh, yeah. like, wow. Like, I don't even, I'm not even sure. It's a little yeah, dangerous. It's kind of fucked up. Who are these people? Yeah. Fuck. That's bad. And then like, you, almost everybody in the band had like the most like wild, like caveman dreads and stuff. Like they weren't like well, like groomed or anything. It was like, it looked like, their hair had just like formed into like these like <laughs> enormous like like just straight crusties. Yeah, it was just, just... Like, it, it was like almost I don't know. There was something like almost like inhuman about the performance. I feel like I was just yeah. Like, really, and I think that when you, you you're not used to like certain cultures too, right? Yeah. You're not used to the traditions of those things. Not at all. Like I remember the first time I was like at a punk show, and I was like. Said, so what the fuck is going on yeah. around me? Uh, are these people killing themselves? Like, what, what's up with it? You know, and but but at the same time, I felt my my senses were like heightened. Like, I felt like I was so aware of like all these things that were happening around me at this BFW hall or at Coney Island High or like all yeah. this shit. You know what I mean? And I was just like blown away at. At, at that kind of feeling like I just felt like everything was like raised up now I'm, I wasn't sure if like I necessarily loved everything that was happening or going on you know on stage but I was like it piqued my interest I was like this is this is like I'm in the red right now this is almost too much but I'm like I want to know about it though you know and then it kind of started bringing me in more and more so for you with with the rake thing after that, and once you started kind of being like, wow, like I'm, I'm starting to really fall in love with like this music and the, the kind of the heaviness and extremity of it, where did it kind of go from there for you? Were there other bands in Arkansas that were kind of in the zone a little bit? Or were, was it like, now I'm just trying to pull out these re other records and, and, and like learn I, more about this? Well, I was, I was definitely interested in heavy bands locally because I was, I was really into hardcore and mm -hmm. still, still am pretty into hardcore, but uh, yeah, I, I was like more at the time like, interested in that, but I, I can't even remember, I can't remember the names of like any of the very few hardcore bands there were at the time. Uh, sure. But what were some uh, other ones I, that you just liked as a whole? As I continued to get more into stuff that was like kind of more in the like, like, sludge or doom and the things and little rock like shitfire was another band that was like massively important um there was also obviously dead bird that mm. was uh, that was another band that i i actually i had heard their record way before i saw them and the, the record just like really really blew me away and then uh I eventually, oh yeah, I I did see Burned Up Blood Dry once. Uh, I see that Nate is. Yeah, get, giving tips. That's that's really interesting. So that was like kind of the little scene that kind yeah. of started doing it doing it for you, and then bringing some of that that yeah. in where you were like, oh, I'm gonna Sea fucking Hag, another band. There were some bands that like never really toured very much, like Sea Hag. I don't I don't remember them ever really going outside of the state a whole lot. Maybe they did yeah. once or twice. Shipfire never really toured. So I, really to be honest with you, I haven't heard of many of these groups, you know, and, and that's because I'm from the Northeast. Yeah. And there, it's cool to have that regionalism, though, and be like, yo, these are some of my, my like, treasures, you know, like my, my, my heroes. I'm always really interested in, in that. And I think that a lot of people listening right now are too, like, hey, I want to know who burned up Bled Drives and, and Dead Bird and Sea Hag, you yeah. know, and kind well, of check some of those bands out. All of those bands kind of have this common thread that I feel like is the Arkansas sound. Like there's a there's a very heavy use of the harmonized guitars that mm -hmm. obviously also utilize. I see. Every and, band has the the like the harmonized guitars pretty much. Ah, uh, I didn't know that. 
out of Arkansas has the has the dual guitars and there's a lot of guitar harmonies. Ah, uh, okay. So like a lot of like harmonies in in the Doom. I mean, you know, obviously I've heard Rake a lot and uh I actually played a show with them and Hull, uh Primitive Weapons opened up for Hull and it was Hull's uh record release show at Mercury Lounge. It was a fucking amazing show. Rake was amazing. I think that was the last time I saw them actually. Um and they were they were fucking great and and I think you know you guys had just really started to pop up with sorrow and extinction and stuff like that and uh and, and I'm like, oh okay, well, obviously these guys are a bit older, like I could see that you know kind of lineage of like a little bit, but I did all these other points around it that's what always gets me going. I'm always like, hey, oh my God, like what is all this other stuff because when you hear something that you love and you're like, yeah, harmonized guitars, that's like part of the Arkansas sound. I'm yeah. like, tell me, <laughs> you know, that that's really cool. And so um, do you know if a lot of these bands have their music online nowadays or, or not as much? That, uh, I know that Sea Hag has some stuff. Obviously, like Dead Bird has put out several records. Like one of them is on Earache. Uh-huh. Uh, and then... One of them, I can't remember. It might be on like translation loss or something like that. And then yeah, one yeah. 20 bucks spin uh -huh. like a year or two ago. Nice and shout out to Tony bucks spin. Great label. Um, Shitfire put out a couple records, but they, I don't even think that any of their songs are available to listen to online anymore. Uh, that's a shame. I feel, like, I feel like, I feel like it needs to be done, you know, it needs yeah. to be done so people you know, can, kind of reference these things i wish i i wish i actually had one of their records just because i i would like to listen to the songs but uh i used to have one of the cds but in one of my like many moves over the years it disappeared and i i don't even have the cd player anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah man it's just chilling in, in your mom's basement somewhere whatever um so you listen to th these bands right you're starting to immerse yourself in this sort of arkansas scene like you're about it now. And so when does the idea of like, okay, we're going to do Paul Bear, how does that start coming about? Well, I saw somebody in the, I'm like occasionally seeing the comments down at the bottom. Somebody asked, yeah, yeah. Forts, which is the band that I was in with Brett before Paul Bear. Oh, uh, shit. I was just like, yeah, there's no sports to talk about, motherfucker. <laughs> so, uh, that, sh that shit's over. So when Brett and I were both, like, I met Brett in college. I had been there for a couple of years already when Brett arrived and uh we like basically just i, I saw brett like wearing a, a catatonia shirt i was like yo let's jam <laughs> like i love it. Like, that's my fucking guy across the quad get him over here now <laughs> so uh initially like i was he was coming to jam with me and some other people that i had been playing some music with that was kind of like more in the like post rock realm, I guess. But I, I think they were already like scheming on keeping me out of the band <laughs> because I, I kept like trying to make it heavy. Uh huh. Nobody else really was into it. Like I'd be like, yeah. Let me try like doing this part like this, and it'd be like, You're in the wrong tuning. So. <laughs> So like I get Brett to come jam. This is I've literally like this. This is like the first time I've ever like really interacted with him. So I'm just like, dude, let's like jam. Let's come jam yeah. with me and my like buddies. So <laughs> we get up there and we like jam for like an hour. That these these guys like space, which is in some weird like uh like sheet metal kid. Like somebody like machine shop or something like that. See, that's jam. how I imagine it though. That's like a Skinner. Thing. Like I, this yeah. is how I want it to happen. That's fabulous. So we're jamming up there, and like at some point in time, like the other guys that I'd already been jamming with, like all just walk out. <laughs> but Brett and I just keep jamming for like a couple hours, and we're just like, fuck. And so like I talked to the guys after, and they were like, yeah. They like I talked to the the walkouts the walkouts <laughs> they were like scared you know, we didn't really like his mashuga riffs that he was playing <laughs> and so i was like oh well right on i'm just gonna keep playing with him like wow <laughs> strong <laughs> and strong like, decision I continued playing with him in there <laughs> 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 wow 
It was probably all like, there are a bunch of jerks like, from the like, start. The sense of time is probably a little skewed. It was probably like forty five minutes or something like that. But anyway, we we basically were just like, fuck all y'all. We're gonna keep doing this. And so they were like, All right, well we're gonna leave. You guys just like close up whenever you're done. So we uh I like took my base gear back with me and then uh from that point like Brett and I started like messing around with some stuff. Eventually we started just doing this like pure like one hundred percent like amplifier destruction band where we were just collecting like as many like amps and cabs as we could find. And like a juicifery them at the same time. And it would just be like pure like improv. Oh we shit. Would, like, it was and there was one other guy too named Paul. And so we it was it was somewhere uh it's like somewhere between like Sun and Purant pretty much. Wow, just somewhere just between, pure Yeah. With also with like synths in there and every show was different. Sometimes we had drum machines. Sometimes it was just like pretty much like one note for the, for the Was there any vocal at all whatsoever? Uh yeah. Sometimes, sometimes Rhett would do vocals through the wall of caps. Like he would Wow. Like, he had uh I mean this was all like totally uh just like pieced together by us. Like he was running like a microphone through hit this like weird uh like multi effect that he had that was for guitar, not for yeah. Uh, it's just kind of crazy because when obviously I think about, you know, your music so tonal and like beautiful and, and harmonic and all that stuff. So to just kind of almost uh, think about you guys playing that sort of really blown out, distorted noise, like Jucifer level calves yeah. plus, uh, uh, you know, whatever thing. It, it's kind of an amazing way that this is how this project started because I'm kind of like Brett's over here singing like a bird and Joe just starts playing or something, but that's clearly not how it really I, you worked. Know, I think to a degree. I mean, we, we still like enjoyed having some sense of like melody through it, but it was all improvised. But yeah, at some point in time we were like, well, first of all, like every show is a nightmare because we're having to like load all this gear ourselves. And, like, you were getting like, muscles, like new muscles. Like, friend's mom's minivan or something like that we were like carrying all this and all this stuff and like shit would break at every show because we were trying to cram everything into like into tiny vehicles and stuff at some point oh. we're like, all right we're like essentially just like impoverishing ourselves let's like try to <laughs> let's try to like start another band that actually has like riffs and we like write the songs ahead of time just to uh -huh. point to the sport so your your your, your <laughs> avon sensibilities are bankrupting you that's what happened <laughs> yeah we just uh we were like this this will be a way that we don't have to take all our gear to the shows we can like uh -huh. play shows where we're like we each just have like like two or three cabs instead of like Eight so that's what made you want to write songs. The the, the the culling of the gear made you want to be like, okay, now we're going to kind of do a band that we're going to maybe have like a little a, bit more form. It was like a combination of that and being like really, really depressed. Uh, that's the other thing, I guess. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, so yeah, so how did those, so oh, pretty organically, those conversations just started coming up and being like, hey, why don't we try and do this? this kind of doom thing and like how did it start kind of culling you know itself into like the Paul like that Paul Bear sound that we all heard on that like demo or like oh man you know because when I listen to that I'm you know I'm thinking trouble and, and warning and you know yeah. a lot of different things you know and and yeah. and, and I was blown away because I feel like at the time uh when I first heard you guys play it was uh I felt like it was honestly a lot of the stuff that was coming out that was gaining a lot of like attention and traction in the underground and stuff like that was like the first incarnation of Paul Bear, which was stuff like Sun and very Avon, uh, really dissonant, atonal kind of stuff, or even, you know, more in the black metal realm, like, you know, uh, that's Bell Omega or, you know, just really like everyone was kind of, I felt like a lot of, um, there was just like a lot of extremity and it was kind of being pushed that way, which is great. And then all of a sudden, I see this this band from Arkansas just kind of like rose up with this like this demo of like these songs, and I was like, oh my god, like 
holy shit, this dude is singing his ass off. Like, what is this? You know, at, at that moment, it felt so fresh to hear something like that. So to me, it's kind of interesting that, you know, there's all these bands that were kind of in that sunny, kind of very experimental, you know, kind of thing. And then you guys made this turn. How did that turn sort of happen? I mean, at the time, I, I know we were listening to a ton of classic doom stuff, like from a lot of different eras. But I mean, like Reverend Bazaar was a big one for us. Um, well Heaven Wept was a really big one for us. Um, I think we were just like, we were interested in trying to sort of combine that like true doom, traditional doom kind of stuff. And then the, like a little bit of the, the like Peaceville era, like death doom things with the Arkansas sound. Like we wanted to like kind of take the rawness and almost to a degree, like the looseness of the Arkansas stuff. Cause the, like all the bands would get really fucked up when they play. Like there was this like <laughs> lurching unhingedness to it that to us was like the, this like really, uh, it's like achieving this like ecstatic state. Mm. Like, I, I always felt like, especially seeing Dead Bird, they would, they would all get like so fucked up on stage that it like seemed like everything was about to like fall apart. But like, yeah. it's like teetering on the edge. It was incredible. Like, and I always felt like so moved by that. And like, it was so... There's a lot of drama in that. Visceral. So that was like, we wanted to, we always like, wanted it to be sort of like a combination of that and the like Arkansas style writing with the sort of like traditional doom stuff you know like we we eventually sort of evolved like almost right away <laughs> like evolved into doing stuff that was like a little more proggy I think we we ended up just like I, I don't know like it was just yeah like, totally like, I feel like like move away from the the really like simple structures but it's it's actually like to a degree like coming back around to that again i don't know yeah i feel like um you know when when i heard the band and stuff like that and i, I feel like what you were saying like when when bands are kind of teetering at the edge of like almost imploding it's always like a lot of there's a lot of drama like when i first saw i hate god i'm like are these who the fuck are these maniacs and they got up there and they like held it together and it was so powerful yeah. and just so unhinged. That's where it was just, I remember seeing them. And I was like, what the fuck is this? And it's slow. You know, I'm like this hardcore kid that like, if everything isn't like, I'm like, all right, cool. And that was just the drama of that just drew me in. I was like, what the fuck is this about? Yeah. I and remember I was seeing like, them uh, right after the end of my freshman year in college. Like I ended up, I went and donated plasma to get money to go to the I Hate God show, which I, <laughs> I, was, I Oh, I, man, I, that's I, great. I, was gonna faint. I watched for like, maybe like 35 or 40 minutes. And it's like, I can't, I can't stand up anymore. <laughs> I got no plasma. I got no fucking plasma. That's fucking hysterical. So you donated plasma to go see I Hate God. Yeah. You gave blood to go see I Hate God. How many people can say that? That's fucking, that's, that's an amazing thing. Um, I think that a performance like that for me at St. Vitus was Cavity. Do you remember the band Cavity from I Miami? I never saw them, but I was a big fan of them. Dude, oh man. They played at St. Vitus once and they, the singer was just so fucked up. And, you know, they, they, they were all just like loose and it was just Southern and nasty. And like, I'm like, this dude, he tried to talk every once in a while between songs, couldn't understand a fucking word out of his mouth. And he was kind of like almost doing like a back bend like this while he was singing, like oh, like shit. really bent backwards like this, but he was perfect. Like the, his tone, the words, everything coming out of him was perfect. It was, And then it was, as like, soon as they stopped, you were like, oh my God, is this guy gonna fall off the stage? But there's something about that that just uh, I absolutely love. Um, and at the same time, you know, it takes a toll, but there's something about that mystique or like that really just tapping into the visceralness that is really like, 
completely enchanting to me. Like, it's just like, when you see something, somebody going through that, it's like seeing somebody else in like their kind of like truer, truer form. Um, I actually, uh, it's kind of funny. I'm just thinking back too, and uh, reminds me, I remember when you guys first came to, to Vitus and when you guys kind of, um, you know, for, came and you played your, your first show over there. And uh, was, did you guys tell me that that was your first time in New York City? Yeah. That's so, yes, like Pentagram. That was so wild to me. Like, uh, I still, like, remember that. And I felt like, here are these cats and you guys are all sitting on the sidewalk outside, just kind of like looking around. And I'm like, uh, hey, what's up? And I'm like, are you guys Paul there? And they're like, yeah, yeah man, hey, what's <laughs> up, you know? And I'm like, uh, come inside. Like, you know, you can hang out or whatever. And um, this will bring us back to the Prague thing. And I remember all of us hanging out, just get along, getting along great. You guys delivered, like, your first show. We kind of weren't sure exactly how, you know, the band had never been to New York. I was going to go. And it was rammed, and, and people, like, knew the songs, you know? And this was on the demo. This was before that record had come out. So um, it was just such an amazing reaction. It, it obviously showed you had like this will behind you. And then I, I really remember I just hanging out for a while and having drinks. And I think Artie uh, was playing Rush and Yes and stuff like that. And you guys just sat at that bar and we got fucking hammered. <laughs> and you guys are just, and, and uh, I mean, if you guys ever know, Rush and 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 yes are you know Artie's like favorite bands. If you yeah. ever see him around St. Vitus, his favorite shit on earth, and uh, you know Prague legends, of course. And I just remember you guys chopping it up about that kind of stuff. And I was like, I think I know where this might end up going <laughs> in a little while. Dude, this is kind of an aside from that, but for the longest time, like way before I moved up here, like any time we would be in New York, we we always even if we weren't playing at Vitus, we would always make sure to come to Vitus after the show or like, yeah, I see. It, it got to be this thing where we were like afraid to go because we knew how bad we would feel the next day. And I, I remember like one time we went, I'm glad and, this is a one hour interview. So I'll be, <laughs> I'll be fine after, uh, after it's all done. There was one night that we went, I know that we stayed talking to Artie about yes, for sure until like five in the morning and then i remember the next thing i knew is i woke up in the van the next day parked on the street and it like everybody was sleeping in the van this is our like back in our old really shitty van that we had that its name was jim vandy uh jim vandy all right Pina. uh i woke up and on the inside of the windshield it was like there was a bunch of moisture on it Apparently, like, before I had fallen asleep, I had written, fuck everything. <laughs> <laughs> it was, like, Very fun. totally fogged up, but it just said, fuck everything. And I was, like... I wish you would have taken a picture. Would have hang it up in the bar. Yeah, we just had all, like, I guess, piled out of the bar and, like, just, like, all, like, paraded over the, to the van and just, like, fallen asleep. <laughs> like, and then I, yeah, then I, oh. right... I have never had to piss so bad in my entire life, I think. Like, because <laughs> we, I don't even know how much we had drank at the bar. Like, that's great. That's fantastic. I mean, that's what St. Vitus is for. It's to have a fucking, <laughs> a fabulous time, play some music, enjoy some music. So, uh, Foundations of Burden, right? We're cruising into to that period of the band. Now, I feel like uh, all these synthesizers behind you, we got a bunch of people asking about them. Um, stuff like that but i feel like that's when the band started really exploring into the, the, the prog territory and you guys were like you know cool like bringing in a, a lot of this this sort of like synth influence and, and just you know it was the first time i think that you really started singing on the records a lot more and doing a lot of harmonies and stuff like that which is really great to hear like just kind of like this opening of it how did like kind of just you know synth playing and bringing that into paul bearer how did that sort of work? Did you, you kind of were already doing it on your own a little bit and did, did it weave itself in or was it something that, hey, we're, you know, oh, hey, we've been writing this song. I think I can add something in. There's there's synth on every Paul Bearer record. So it was, yeah. the, only, the only one that there's no synth on is the demo, I think. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, for sure. Because there's the one at the end that, yeah, of the, yeah. of Sauron yeah. Extinction. So there's been synth consistently at least one song on every single record. Yeah. We, gotcha. We generally don't tend to write songs around the synth necessarily just because it's, I think we all like generally try to stick to our main instrument for the live yeah. setting. We've been talking about ways that we can start like bridging the gap out of that, but uh, that's probably a discussion <laughs> for another time. But, yeah, man. Keep that in the yeah, sports we, chat. We, the synth stuff has like always been kind of a part of our DNA. It just we we try not to necessarily go like two balls to the wall with it all the time. Like in, uh, it's we we try to think like scrutinize like pretty heavily like where we think it'll work the most effectively so. yeah yeah for sure i mean it sounds beautiful it textured it always sounds very natural to me and i feel like a lot of you know kind of doom and like and like proto metal stuff has a lot of like cool synth in it as well you know and if you guys listen back to a lot of, of stuff like that you know from the 70s etc you, you'll find so much of it and it just it's just great to me. It just really like enhances everything from Hawkwind and et cetera, et cetera. You know, you can yeah. just find all that sort of sprinkled through. Um, we got about another 15 minutes left. Uh, I just want to, you know, thank Joe for coming on. And I want to just give another word that we are taking donations for our staff while we are unfortunately inoperable at St. Vitus. So I just want to throw up the Venmo real quick. You could Venmo St. Vitus Bar if you want to donate to our staff. And you can follow me in the bar over here. And um, I want to kind of switch up from the Paul Bear discussion real fast to also just talking about the stuff behind you because you've also released a little bit of new music yourself in this past couple of uh, weeks yeah. as well, right? So why don't you tell us about yeah. some of that stuff too? Because that's where the, I think the synth takes center stage for you. Yeah. Uh so I guess I guess the main thing is uh, I finally started getting there, Stephanie. Some music out there. I I have a a new project with Darren Beck from Pinkish Black. A phenomenal I, fucking I, band, phenomenal band. Anyone out there is listening, incredible. Yeah, it's called Information Age, like information underscore age. Uh, it's kind of gothy italo disco inspired synth pop um i put a couple songs out on Bandcamp, and i'm planning on if i can really like muster up the uh the time during this <laughs> this little bit of downtime everybody has to finish up the the album that i recorded last year with darren so that's awesome uh, uh guys uh, it should be coming. Hopefully, uh, my goal is to have it all done and mastered in May. So that should be That's out. awesome. But That's great. I started putting out some other music under my uh, my Hosiana Mantra moniker. I actually, uh, that, I, I put uh, some stuff up and it's on Spotify now and iTunes and Apple Music. Oh, great. That. So, so that, that's, and what's that kind of stuff like? That stuff is like, kind of evolved over time. More under the like cosmic synth, like total like kraut rock, uh, tangerine a dream, more, a little more raw. Yeah, tangerine dream. It's it's way less uh, composed, I guess, than the information age stuff. Like with that stuff, I spent like weeks like putting together like pieces of the songs, like producing everything. The the Hosiana Mantra stuff is a little more free form and I the stuff that I put up at least is I had the I don't know, I I sort of like felt motivated to just work on some stuff and like put it out, like just let it be like pure inspiration and no like hemming and hawing over the mix and like trying to like figure out like whether like one little thing should be sure. Or just like way more <laughs> free flown. <laughs> A little more stuff like that pretty soon. And then I also, like, the last couple of days, let me see if this will play. It may not. I can't remember if I... I started, uh... Started messing around with something else. I don't even know. I don't even know what it is, really. I've just been, uh... 
a good sequence. Right, that's like, what it sounds like. I've been uh, putting together something that just sort of like sounds like a theme from a like eighties like horror movie or something like that. But uh, I've been working and on the recording the whole thing in one take the last couple of years. For, just for uh, so uh, they can get my like be able to like focus my attention on that and like not worry like whether or not I'm having like some sort of like like chest pains or something. <laughs> I feel like my yeah, it's uh, kind of amazing, right, to work when you're doing all this stuff and you're like, holy shit, yeah, you know, uh, it's a great way to turn off the world and then you turn the world kind of back on again yeah. when you're like not working on this creative you know kind of outlet yeah. and you're like. So Fuck. Like, have, things are kind of wild out there yeah i have this like whole studio room in my apartment and uh last couple of days i've just been like rehearsing playing through this track in like one go so that i could like get like this perfect take of it uh maybe i'll make a video of that like uh my my partner and i have been talking about oh, hi elizabeth if she's watching uh she's in the other room <laughs> with a cat uh, Oh yeah, and the cat. The cat has been shut out of the room because I, I knew that she would totally. and start, start trying to make I, it. Yeah. I know. I know a thing about this cat. Um, I just want to say, just real quickly, um, for the information age stuff. Yeah. It's kind of in that real Italo disco uh, kind of category. If any of you guys out there like anything that Johnny Jewel's done, chromatics things of in that sort of world, or have really listened to Giorgio Moroder or anything like that. You have to check out Information Age. It's really great. I've gotten a few little sneak peeks in there, and I'm really excited to hear what you have out there. And if any of you are DJs out there, you got to cop that record because it'll make people move. So it's a really great one. Um, and so basically, you've been holed up. You've been working on these these sort of synth projects and stuff like that. Um, and then Paul Bear stuff. I mean, you guys, I guess, are constantly writing, doing things like yeah. that. We heard about promotional things. We're kind of keep it there. Yeah, I. Uh, the only thing that I'm really at liberty to say is the record is is done and has been done for a while. Uh, Isn't that so f fucking great? What a good yeah, feeling, right? The only, I mean, you know, we're just right now. We're kind of like, like I said earlier, we're taking it day by day. Uh, you know, I, I don't know exactly what's going to happen yet with like when it's coming out but uh releases and stuff like that yeah. Actually, yeah i i uh i hope that it will be sooner rather than later yeah i think that we all you know we are we're all hoping for that sort of return to uh normalcy and yeah. things like that to kind of come back so we can you know all sit and you know not just see joe in front of all of his equipment but maybe behind it playing applying it to, to us and, and, and crowds of people all over the world. Uh, so basically, you know, we're all kind of, you know, in, in our in our homes kind of staying away from anything. Is there anything uh, in particular that you have going on that's inspiring you? Anything that you've seen, listened to, anything else as we've kind of been checking so much, you know, different like media out and stuff like that? I've been listening to a lot of playlists, trying to learn some new stuff about my own gear. I don't know, different things. Any any quarantine things like that? Interestingly enough, I haven't I haven't really been checking out a lot of new stuff like the last at least like the last week or so because I've been kind of in my own zone on trying to like work on work on this like track that I don't even know what <laughs> I'm gonna do with. But, uh, um, yeah. Well, I think that that's. That's the way that things work, right? You started this noise, this like noise doom band, and it turned into this beautiful monolith of a of a of a heavy doom kind of uh, you know kind of crowd rocky band. You know what I mean? So whatever it turns into, we'll we'll, we'll be listening in. Yeah, I, think I, I think I might be on kind of a uh, Werner Herzog kick right now. So that's sick. That would be the uh, the current inspo. That's great. I love to. I love to hear it. Well, guys, we're about to wrap up because this thing is about to kick me off in about ninety seconds. Uh, Joe, cheers! Thanks so much for doing cheers. this and you know coming by and hanging out and uh, you know keep making that great music. Stay well, be healthy. Same hi to out. Later, everybody. Stay tuned for tomorrow's episode with Chris Enriquez.
He will be on tomorrow with Riley Gale from the one and only Power Trip. Bye.